I want to make a difference in people's lives and I want to help transform economies. Spent eight years at Citibank, moving through the ranks. Then I had the opportunity to be promoted into essentially the equivalent of an assistant vice president. But the next challenge is coming. My life for me did not make sense for a while. They started to use big words like, you're going to have to have chemotherapy. I was like, what? I started the grief that came up from losing my dad, who had lost three years earlier, came up. I did not discuss that journey with many of my clients. I worked right throughout. While we have this illusion of control in our lives, there is not actually full control. There is power, however, in accepting that and learning to surrender. Today I have someone who I have briefly got to know, um, a dear friend of mine and a friend of the podcast, um, Jessica, recommended that I speak to this amazing woman. And, you know, Jessica says you do something, you do it. And she was absolutely right. Like the conversation you are about to listen to is from someone who has been a trailblazer. And you know what? Let me not let me not even get into it. I'm gonna ask my esteemed guest if she could introduce herself because you know I don't like I don't like bios. Bios don't do people justice. I wanna with her own words. Let's just jump in and just get right to it, eh? Let me jump in and get right into it. Like, with your own words, how do you introduce yourself? So how I introduce myself, I always say to people, first and foremost, I am an infrastructure nerd. And people are just like, really? What? This is what you have to say about yourself? I said, yeah, tell me about the day that you don't have a road to drive on, that you don't have Wi-Fi, that you don't have power, that you don't have water. Then you realize how important infrastructure is. Infrastructure changes people's lives. Infrastructure changes economies. And so... I have spent my career in banking. Um, I have done everything corporate investment banking at Citi. Um, before mid-career, I decided to come to the World Bank Group, specifically at IFC, which is a private sector arm of the World Bank, because cliche as it may sound, because I want to make a difference. Um, and so my whole thinking has been around how do we do things that make a difference in people's lives? And I have the pleasure of working and leading um, our transaction advisory practice uh, in public-private partnerships in a region where I'm from. I'm Jamaican, um, and I work right across the Caribbean. And we have small islands with big infrastructure gaps, but with massive potential for transformation. And so every day, this infrastructure nerd gets up and I'm excited to see what we can do with governments that really want to be serious about infrastructure development, with governments that are looking to leverage private finance, which governments which are looking to leverage um, really a different way of procuring infrastructure and to accelerate infrastructure development as a way of driving economies. And I am just that little infrastructure nerd that helps them to do it. And I do it with a team who, like myself, are equally excited and motivated by that. So that's it for me. I, I lead a small but nimble team. Um, when I joined, this business was like a nascent business. Literally, we had and we're doing one transaction. I don't focus on the transactions. I focus on the end game, which is the impact. And when I focus on the end game, the rest falls into place. So that's a little bit about me, and we can take it from there. <laughs> I, I'm curious around even that infrastructure nerd. Have you always had that? Like, go back to a younger, a younger Michelle, like. Can you see the elements of that from day dot, or was that a different, different Michelle at those times? No, well, I've always liked to figure out how things work, eh? Um, and if you want to talk about going back, this was even before career. Um, if you talk to my parents, I built airplanes on bunk beds because I thought, okay, we want to travel. Let's figure it out. We're going to build it. <laughs> so, you know, with a little bit of plyboard and some patio furniture, we had, we had essentially planes that we used to essentially board, and I used to be like, great, I built it. Now I don't have to build it myself because I'm not an engineer, but I am a transaction advisor. And what I've spent a lot of my career doing is sort of see where is the opportunity that we can help to build infrastructure? Where is there a problem to be solved? Because very often when governments say we need to expand a road, we need to build our broadband in areas that they don't have, infrastructure or broadband infrastructure it's essentially a problem that needs to be solved so going back i've always had that fascination and so i started in corporate and investment banking at city uh working multi-sectors um 
and then finding that I gravitated most to infrastructure sector. So when I moved over to the World Bank, delight, delight, um, I took over um, I jumped into a role um, in our public-private partnerships advisory. It's a mouthful. It's a lot of keys in there. But ultimately, it is looking with governments as private sector how they help to address the infrastructure gap, how they help to build out their um, infrastructure for populations, because ultimately, this is what's going to drive economic growth. So, yes, as I said, going back, my early days in infrastructure started from, you know, building my planes at about seven. And right now I'm building much bigger infrastructure across multiple countries. You mentioned earlier on that you, you moved into, or you moved to Citibank. Bank. That used to be your, your dream role from when you first started in the finance and then the boutique merchant bank to get into that. And I wanted to, you skipped over that quite quickly. I was like, no, there was a journey there. What was that journey for you of going from the merchant bank to city bank? Because that was not an easy transition to get your, your dream role at that point in time anyway. No, it, it was not. Um, but what I have always been is very, even, you know, before I even started working, I very, very much focused on what is it that I want for myself? Because I find if I can set intentions for myself and stay focused on that, I can get there because I started my career right out of university in banking and I worked with um, a small boutique merchant bank called Pan Caribbean Merchant Bank and we were across the street from Citibank. And at that time I was, um, you know, building my career in Jamaica, in Kingston, Jamaica and all of the city bankers in Jamaica, we used to call it City University because they used to turn out a lot of the bankers who ended up in senior positions and C-suite positions and I used to say, I want to work there one day. And um, it didn't happen the first time because I tried the first time and it was like that didn't happen and it wasn't the right road. And when it did, it clicked. And I had an absolutely fantastic time working at City. Um, it was that exposure to professionals who pushed me to another level. It was that exposure to banking that in Jamaica was first class. It was thinking outside of the box to how do we move the needle on things. And that really, that really lit me up. So when I got that job at Citibank, um, I was hired as a corporate relationship manager and I managed um, corporate clients in multiple sectors. So it was a nice opportunity to really see different things, how they work and figure out sort of where I would channel my focus. And um, as I grew in my career at Citibank, I started to realize really the fun of sort of putting together. And I think that that's part of my mind. I like to put pieces of a puzzle together. And so for me, when I look at a deal, that's the first thing. Okay, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? What are the pieces of the policy? How do we put it together? And how do we bring this together in terms of something that we can take from a concept to something that we can bring to market, mobilize investment, um, put together deals, build things that, that, that change lives. And so that's what it was about for me. And so I spent eight years at Citibank moving through the ranks and then ultimately ended up in wait wait wait, wait. I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah okay go right ahead you see you see you see you see how you see how Michelle just went shoot I, I, I spent eight years and moved up the ranks he went from vice president to global corporate like it's that's reason so res, resident vice president to vice president of the global corporate bank in eight years yeah it was a that's uh that's quick it was a fun eight years. Um, and one thing about that organization, I will say, Citibank pushed me, um, and but Citibank also rewarded me. It was a very fulfilling point in my career because I joined as a corporate relationship manager. Um, and as I really got to enjoy that and started to develop my portfolio, then I had the opportunity um, to be promoted into what they call a resident vice president, essentially the equivalent of an assistant vice president. Um, and that was still in corporate banking. Then an opportunity opened up in uh, capital markets. Um, so doing some of those large episodic deals and I made a lateral move. And then from there, then I made a move into vice president. And that's ultimately um, where my career went in eight years. That's a drive. What does that drive come from from you? You know what it is? Honestly, I tell people it's not something that I think a lot about. If I'm doing something that I love, um, I don't actually think about it. I just jump in. Um, and so with Citibank, it was something I'd always wanted to do. I'd always wanted to work there because it was an opportunity um, while being in Jamaica to work with a multinational 
um, to see a bigger picture, to see a, bi a bigger vision. And when I jumped in, I absolutely loved what I did. I worked with fantastic professionals who today I still am in touch with many of my ex-colleagues from CD um, who are doing great things. And so when I find something that I'm passionate about, it happens easily. Now, I will say what I look at is much more the mind shift that I've made in my career. Because what got me there from Citibank is not what's going to get me to the next level. At Citibank, I was very much, it was kind of like, here is a job that I've wanted. Here is my dream job. I need to prove myself. And it was about what are the corporate targets I need to hit? What revenue do we need to have on our assigned portfolio? You know, how many deals do I need to originate to make sure I got that good bonus and make sure I had good career progression? And then mid-career, I got to that point where I was just like, okay, I've done, seen it. I've done it. I bought the t-shirt. What's next? Like, I wanted more. And that more for me then became, okay, I've proven myself. What I want to do is step into an arena of more where it was not just about doing the deal, but it was stepping back to see what's the impact of the work that I do. And so... I step out of very reluctantly, it took a while for me, but when you know, you know, in your heart of hearts that, you know, that rodeo had ended. And I remembered having that conversation with my boss a year before I left to say, that time is coming. I love working in this organization, but the next challenge is coming. And it was a risky thing because you don't ever want to tell your boss that you're leaving and you have absolutely no job in mind. Yeah, that's, especially a year, a, year, a year before it actually happens. That's a very long time. So it was a bold move, but I also feel that out of respect for the relationship that we had, I had to be very clear with her because I knew in my mind that that change was coming. And I gave the opportunity to work through that with her um, for a smooth transition. So there were no surprises. Um, and Jamaica is a small place. So, you know, you start interviewing for senior level positions. People know they start talking about these things. So. I don't actually, I think out of respect, if you can have a professional relationship with your manager, with your boss, that is a mature relationship, you can talk very openly, depending on the person. And to this day, um, I lift my hat to my manager because I've had some very good managers through my entire career who have helped to mold me, who have helped to mentor me. And I remember when I had that conversation, this is how you know you're sitting with somebody um, that in terms of leadership, this is not a manager, this is a leader. And she said to me, Michelle, I know my role and I know that most of the people who come to me are transient because I'm looking for the best of the best and they don't stick around for long because you're going to do what you came here to do. You're going to fulfill that mandate and you're going to move on to the next opportunity. And my role is to figure out how I help you make that transition in an orderly manner. Because at the end of the day, I continue to work with many of the bankers that I have turned out. And she's right. Because right now, I am trying to do deals in Jamaica, which are deals that we're looking to syndicate. Not millions, billions of US dollars. Um, and we're talking with her because she is a big player in the market and they are a big player in this market. And so it is realizing that relationship is important and when you're dealing with people, that relationships are mature and there is that mutual respect, there can be that honesty and that authenticity about where you are. I never, ever like to get to a stage in a job where I am dissatisfied with where I am. I like to leave when I'm on a high. And so literally, she could not believe it. I got promoted to vice president and three months later, I was just like, I've landed the perfect opportunity. Thank you so much. So this is one of the hardest things that people have where they end up staying longer than they should do is they don't listen to the warning they don't they don't read the warning signs that this is not it like you said you're in a great position you're smashing your targets it's a great bank industry environment leadership that you're reporting into and therefore people can get into that full sense of oh this is this is great even though they know deep in their hearts there's something telling them this is not it there's, there's more to this but people don't always want to lean into that thought so how do you looking at you and you making that decision a year ago and recognizing something was there. What are some of those signs that you saw that can help other people who might be thinking about this for themselves? Um, the biggest sign for me is when contentment starts to border. Uh, it goes from slightly a bit too content to actually a little bit bored. I.e. I can wake up and do my job 
without thinking about it. I'm on autopilot. Because what it means is that I'm not being challenged. And if I'm not being challenged, I'm not growing. I am all, we have always been somebody with a growth mindset. And I believe that no matter where you are in your career, there is always something for you to learn. If you have gotten to the day that you come in and there is nothing for you to learn, what I don't see what how that serves you. So for me, once I started to get to the point that I could do those deals, eyes closed, without thinking about it, I was like, okay, I'm not growing. I am contributing and making a strong contribution, but I think the most beneficial relationships are two-way. I should be able to make a strong contribution to an organization, but an organization also should be making a strong contribution to my growth. And when the scales start to tip such that I don't feel myself growing, that's that little niggling that starts to say to me, what next? And when I hear the what next whisper, that's for me. When it's time to start thinking and reflecting and dropping down and sort of say, what is it that I want? What is it that's pushing me to change? Where is it that I need to go? I don't always have the answers, but if I sit with myself quietly long enough um, and I listen to myself, and when I say myself, the truth of who I am, because sometimes, you know, we can talk ourselves out of the noises and we can hear the voice, no man, no, 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 it's not a good time. He just got promoted. He smashed, girl, he got a good bonus. You could make enough, no. Literally, you have to stop. Time out, time out. And spend time with yourself in reflection. Also, I find it's important, surround yourself with the right people, the sounding boards around you who you start to talk with about where your mind is because it's always important. I've always very much, I've been, I'm a strong believer in mentorship. So I've always had mentors throughout my career. So it is that sounding board that I can signal. I'm just like, this is where I'm thinking. This is where I'm at. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm thinking. And it's interesting to get that perspective from more experienced heads. And I've always gone for mentors who are in way more senior positions than me. And I've also, also chosen my mentors very strategically. I look around at the people and I say, who do I want to be like you? I'd like you to be my mentor. And I've had some bold conversations with people that are like, you're asked who to be your mentor? What? Well, all they can say is no. If they say no, I'm no worse off than if I didn't ask. But if I ask, there's a possibility they may say yes. Now I have a cadre of mentors who are no longer mentors, but who are in my leadership team, in my chain of command who were not there at the time, but I looked at them and said, I want to learn from this person because I like the way they think. I can see the growth mindset. I like the way they operate. I like how they move in the organization. And today, these are some of the people. So sometimes when people look at me and say, how do you have access to people at such senior level? I'd like, oh, they used to be my mentor like back in the day when they used to be a manager. Okay, now they don't know these move from a manager to being a director to being a VP. I still have access. Not because of anything extraordinary that I did, but because I knew I wanted to learn from that person and I had the guts to just say to them, honestly, I admire you. I'd like to learn from you. Would you be willing to mentor me? Do you ever get scared in either your approach? No, we have, to have the same mindset you do. All they can say is no. But even generally speaking, do you ever get scared with either the approaches or even the things that you take on, which seem quite big and if I take on that on, that might fail. Like, do you ever deal with any of those feelings at all? Absolutely, yes. I'm human. I'm human. And I am a classic overthinker. I tell people there is a little bit of an introvert in me. And introverts, we live in our head. So we like to think about things a lot. What I have learned with time is greater awareness in terms of when I get into that sort of overthinking cycle and what are they going to say? Da, 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 da. How should I do? Da, 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 da. Once I start seeing myself going down the rabbit hole, it's sort of saying, okay, just stop. Just put it in perspective. I'm a person. They're a person. I have an objective that I'd like to go in there, this organization. They are, they are looking to turn out with people in this organization. I literally just start talking myself off of the ledge because sometimes I have to do that because the fear will hold us back and it will keep us stuck where we are. But equally, when that fear rears its head, what we have to do is train ourselves in putting that stop that says, okay, stop. I see, I see myself going down the rabbit hole, stop. And then it is 
just again, that quiet pause that says, let's just reflect on this and say, okay, what could happen? Run through those scenarios. And usually nine times out of 10, it's not as bad as we think they are. We've actually conceptualized them up here. And so a lot of things I found is you can actually stop in the moment and make that mindset shift. That's when you can make leaps because if fear has kept too many people from moving to where they want to be, you know, we're afraid to ask the right question. We're afraid to ask for some of the things that we want. And it's absolutely the fear rears its head. And I have to quiet myself. Okay. And I say, okay, that fear is real. Think about it. What's the worst that could happen? What's the best outcome that could happen? Usually the best is going to win. And I said, okay, you know what? Then the overthinker in me does go back and I'll strategize and say, okay, how am I going to approach this now? Because there's one thing to say, I'm going to do it. The next thing is, how am I going to approach this? Because to me, again, we're people. What is the win-win? What is the benefit here? But I find if you are authentic and I say to somebody, listen, I really admire you. I really admire how you have managed your career. And I would like to learn from you. Because I would like to manage my career in a similar way. I would like to see how I can go in this organization. But I, at my level, do not understand the nuances that you in a more senior person, as a more senior person do. Are you willing to help me? Would you consider being my mentor? When you're honest with people, people very often respect that. Because at the end of the day, to them, it's like, whoa. I've had mentors look at me to say, whoa, you think of me that way? I said, yes. And there are a lot of people who sit in leadership positions but because they're in high positions, a lot of people don't channel back to them. This is what we think of him. But they are also people. Human beings. So if we break it down and get to that level, it's not as complex as we think it is. Yeah. I was saying it was around, you meet people as people, not people in their titles. And I think a lot of times we use the titles as ways of either creating narrative for ourselves or really putting people on ridiculous pedestals that they can never ever attain to whereas when we meet them as human beings and really connect with them on that level they can feel your genuineness your authenticity your curiosity and actually there's a lot of learning that happens both ways because they haven't they might be in position years ago but there's still something around being connected to that that helps them even navigate in their senior positions as well well people don't tend to think about that but it's also fun being on the other end it's also fun being mentored it's, it's also fun mentoring people, but it's also fun mentoring. I also enjoy doing that very much because it's seeing the next generation of leaders coming back. Um, and again, I have had, I have been approached by people and their approach is as simple as the approach that I have to say, Michelle, I really admire you. And they will tell you for these reasons, bam, 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 bam. And I would like to work with you. And the universe has this fantastic way of putting the right people together. A lot of the people that I have mentored have been people like myself. People like myself who have spent a lot of their career trying to prove their self, who have struggled with their self-confidence, who have struggled with personalities. They are a little bit more shy and introverted and trying to figure out how to put themselves out there. And so sometimes it is, wow, we were put together for a reason. And so very much I approach mentoring from a very basic premise which is the basic premise out of myself. Okay, what are we really dealing with here? And breaking things down to really simple things. You know, sometimes we think it has to be some big fairy. And actually, when we distill things down to very, very simple things. And when I say, oh, but, you know, it's something that I've dealt with in terms of my, my confidence and, you know, how I speak. They're like, no, no, not you. I said, what? Yes. Yes, indeed. Because, again... They look at me and they see the me that stands up and I can present easily um, to people. I had one of my team members who said to me, Michelle, I don't know how you do it. You can get up in front of hundreds of people and speak and, you know, you can command an audience. I said, yeah, but there's also the me who, when I'm finished speaking to hundreds of people, I want to retreat because there's too much peopling and people want to come and talk to me. And as I said, I've had to learn to stand there in my power and say, no, don't run from this. And I look at it as... Again, the mindset, because I'm just like, when I start to talk about something that is meaningful to me, something I'm passionate about, I'm just like, how is this helping somebody? How is this serving somebody? And so then it's not, I'm here to talk about something. I'm here for a purpose. And if I'm here for a purpose talking about something that I love, I don't go heavily cued. I literally just say, I'm going to talk about something that I love. 
Don't make this over rehearsed. Don't make this over stage. What are some of the key messages I want to think across? Bam, and I go. So many gems, words and words of wisdom, which I like. Very practical things that you can apply and just look at it, change your mindset, change your language. Don't overcomplicate it thinking you need to have these big words. Just simply have a conversation with someone or look at the impact that you're making on people. And that helps you shift away from that, from that fear. It's quite um, interesting when I think about then talking about fear. When you made that next jump from the role that you were doing, are you, I think you moved to Washington, D.C. at that point in time when you went to the World Bank. What was that like for you? So that was all, that was like literally all the feels. It was the excitement, like, oh my God, I can't believe I got this job. And then I remembered walking into the building and you look up and it's this massive rotunda with all of the flags of the world. And I'm like looking around like, and I'm just like, oh, wow. And then it's realizing I'm stepping into a new environment with totally new people. So my safety net as a little introvert is gone. So I now need to build relationships. But overwhelm me, I focus on the excitement because I always tell people excitement and fear feel like the same thing. It's that butterflies in your stomach that, but I'm just like, okay, we're going to go with the excitement and not focus on the fear because it feels the same, but let's go with the excitement. And so I kind of charged in a little naively. Um, and my boss used to laugh at me because, you know, I used to say to him, and it's funny because I was coming from Citibank doing different types of deals. And I used to say to him, you know, so like, how long? And I, I'm a curious man. I ask a lot of questions. So, you know, when we're talking about these deals and you're structuring a public-private partnership and you're doing the due diligence and you're talking to investors and you're running a tender, I was like, how long do these things take? And he's just like, 18 to 24 months. Me and my arrogance say, yeah, but it's like, but how hard and efficient could you guys be? I mean, like, I used to do a deal six, nine months and I'm out there, bam, 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 bam. He's just like, in time, you'll know. Now I know. <laughs> Time is a great equalizer. You learn so much. But it has been such a great ride. And so also I had a boss who interestingly like me, very well spoken, and I learned like myself. It was a bit of an introvert and I had to learn to overcome that. And so I knew that that was somebody that was an ally to me. I knew that that was somebody I could go and sit and have honest conversations. I've always taken the approach that just ask questions. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? So I would ask questions about everything. Um, the one thing he had to train me out of is I used to say we, and he's like, who's the we? Because I was just like, well, the way we do things, and he's just like, which we are we talking about? I was just like, oh, old we, Citibank, okay, new we, okay? So I had to retrain my mind into that new job. Exactly. And then when I got into it, I got into it. And it's been such, it's been such a delight. Um, and it's a delight much more from looking at where this region started and where this business started to where it is now. Because when I joined, again, a lot of governments were like, when you go to talk to them about public-private partnerships, and they're like, what, are, what, what do you mean? And I used to have to, we sp I spent the first part of my career actually doing a lot of education, working with other regional partners. How do we help to build education about how this can be useful to governments? That this is not just a fiscal tool, this is a tool to move the needle on efficiency of public goods, public services, public infrastructure, to move the needle on development, on economies. And we used to have to get into the education before we could get into the richness of the discussions. And then when we started to get into the richness of the discussions, it became the excitement of, okay, I want to do the next deal. And that's a deal maker in me. And then I realized, I've got to change that mindset. That mindset. You cannot be chasing deals if you're trying to make a difference. You have to stop and you cannot go after everything that moves. You have to learn to be strategic. You have to figure out what is the story behind the deal? How is this going to change people's lives? What is it that they're trying to achieve? What is the problem that they're trying to solve? And so I had to turn up these two things, my ears. I had to learn to listen because I started doing a lot of talking. And there became a point in my career at IFC, my career at the World Bank, where I was just like, I have to stop doing as much talking and more listening because I need to be well tuned to hear the cues of what is the problem I'm trying to solve because only then can I start to work on a solution. Are you listening to the problems on the ground or are you listening to the problems from the potential 
um, private firms that you're talking to around how they see things? Or is it a combination of both? And your role is basically bringing both those two elements together. So I listen first with the perspective of governments because my role is to act an advi- as an advisor to the government. So when a government says to me, okay, I am trying to develop right now, you know, I'm trying to develop a road network because I have a network here that is inconsistent in, that is insufficient to deal with the volume of traffic that is constraining economic activity. First thing I'm hearing is a problem. I'm having an issue with safety. I'm having an issue with this. The issues are the problems. So what are the problems? Then we start to talk about what are the solutions because there are always solutions. Government can go into their toolkit and say, okay, you know what? I'm going to do a public procurement. I'm going to, you know, use fiscal space, 600 million of fiscal space and build these out. Or... I'm going to talk to you and understand, is this something that's suited for a private sector intervention? And part of our role, before we even jump into the transaction, is really to sort of go through the range of options in the toolkit for governments and sort of say, this is a good candidate. Because you can use that $600 million to put into roles, but if that's a transaction that could attract private sector investors and private sector expertise to build that, to develop that, to maintain that, that 600 million is fiscal space that could go into schools, hospitals, social services. So governments are always making decisions. So what it's taught me is to think from a government perspective. I am not a government, but I'm an advisor to government. So I have to think of their considerations first and foremost. Then when we make a decision that says, okay, this is a good candidate. And the government says, Michelle, I'd like you guys to help us develop this. Um, with private sector participation, then I have to put on with a hat. Because I always say to governments, for me to serve you, I have to hear your objectives first, and that's what I'm going out to solve. But it has to be balanced because we're bringing private sector in. So I have to have something that's balanced to the private sector. So I have to think with that hat as well. Because I tell them, I said, there's a reason that it ends with partnership, public-private partnership. For a partnership to work, it has to be meaningful and to work for both parts. So the advisor has to stand in the middle with a 360 de- degree view and say, what does the government want? What does the private sector need? How does this come together in terms of a solution, in terms of a transaction that makes sense? As part of our work also, we recognize that governments are not there as governments to serve themselves. They're here to serve a population. So are we actually have to go out into the communities and understand what are people saying? What are the needs that they need? What are the concerns that they have? And so when I'm doing a deal, I am not just working, you know, so if I'm working on a road, I'm not just working with road engineers and I'm not just working with lawyers who are building the contract, but I'm working with communications consultants because how are we engaging with key stakeholders? How are we hearing the concerns of the communities? How are we hearing what they need? Because how are we going to solve it and how are we going to message to them if we don't understand that? Again, there's a lot of listening that goes into this. And, you know, when I was younger, I used to be much more, yeah, okay, this is what you need. Uh, Little Miss Hotshot, yeah, okay. She evolved. She evolved into, let me understand what you need. Do I have strong opinions? Yes. Do I have strong views? Because I will say, if you ask me for something and says, Michelle, I want you to do this, and I don't think it makes sense, I am not going to be that person that's going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you. I don't think that that's the best approach for these reasons. And I've had some difficult discussions. But what I realize is people will respect you for being authentic and true to yourself. Because where we have had governments that go ahead and I said, I don't think this is the right thing. You are going to run into a problem. I can't make that decision. I'm not a government. I'm not a sovereign nation. You have to make that decision. I'm your advisor. But you're seeing situations where decisions are made that go against what we advise and it doesn't go the way that we intend. And so it's always an opportunity to say, okay, that's happened. What are we going to do with this? How are we essentially going to take that, learn from that, repackage this and go back out? In Jamaica, it's what we would say, how are we going to wheel and come again? Because there are times that she do things that they don't work out. And literally, you know, you have to lick those wounds and say, okay, it's happened. Now, how old, what are we going to do? Because you have to also be prepared 
for the fact that you will not always get it right. You have to be prepared for the fact that you will not always be able to get a deal done. You have to realize that that is not the end all and be all. The end all and be all is this did not happen. What's the lesson from this? What do we need to do differently the next time? And how can we respond in a way? And we've had situations where we have responded from a failed tender, coming back to having a transaction that was a record outcome in terms of revenue sharing to the government. But you actually had to have that moment of reflection after to see what went wrong. But does it ever feel like it's a, it's a massive weight? I mean, if you take the 600 million, for example, it's, it's a lot of money which can make a massive amount of change to the country. And if you don't get it right, then do you ever carry that weight that if I don't get this right, this is on me? Like, I'm, not, I'm just letting, I'm not just letting the, the bank down or, or wherever I'm letting my people down, I'm letting my country down. Do you ever feel that weight or do you not just separate both of them and be like, no, this is my role. My role is to do my job and I do it to the best of my ability and whatever happens. I think being human, we all carry that weight. I do, my team does, because when thing go, things go wrong, nobody likes that. What I do is use that not as something that shuts us down and cripples us, but it's, it's really that opportunity to reflect with my team, with my client, to say, okay, what happened here? What went wrong here? And how do we, quote unquote, come back from this? Um, there is always a responsibility, but there is also an acknowledgement that I can guide and my team can guide to a certain extent, but I cannot make decisions. What is my responsibility is for me, and I've always tried throughout my career, is self-mastery. How do I get better at having the conversations so that they can hear me, that when I say things, they understand I'm not saying things to push an agenda. I'm saying things because I genuinely believe this is in the best interest, because then how you message things very much impacts how people hear it and respond to it and how they perceive it. And then it impacts the decision that they make. It's interesting that sometimes when there is a defending of turf, sometimes, yeah, but we this and you guys that, sometimes I stop and I say to them, we're actually one team. I am an extension of you. If I am acting as your advisor, I am an extension of you. So it's not uh, us and them. It's a we. It's a collective decision. So let's just stop and let's hear from you what is a concern and try and see how we can solve that. Now, in that process, I won't lie, you get beat up a few times. You know, you have a, you have a few minutes as well, like, Michelle, Michelle. And I'm just like, it's one of those moments. And you have to develop the skill of not taking things personally because they are running, they're, they're running governments, they're running countries, they're running economies. They are going to interrogate you to ensure that they make the best possible deal that they can in their discretion and they're well within their right. So if they have to ask me the hard questions, I have to be prepared to answer. Again, what I also have to do is be prepared to step back and sort of see when they come at me to say, okay, stop. Is there merit in what they're saying? Do I need to consider this differently? And I will also say to my team, sometimes I will say to them when we will go back behind closed doors to say, should we do things differently? Did you hear something that I did not hear? I watch body language when people are speaking to me because sometimes what they say is not what they mean. And sometimes they're like, yes, Michelle. And with this, and the head is going in another direction. I'm just like, oh no, that's not a yes. That, that's a, that's a, I don't want to tell you what it is. And that's a, I need to ask some more questions. So I love, you know, COVID was that time where we had too many Zoom meetings and too many Microsoft Teams meetings. I'm a good old school banker. I love to sit across the table from people. I like to see other words align. Just look at them in the eye. <laughs> you know, look at me in the eye kind of thing. Because, you know, as you, I mean, like, I'm, as you, you're old school, I'm old school. I, rec I recognize it. You know, me and one of my colleagues were talking and we realized, we said, listen, we're at the stage of our career. We are no longer the hotshot that can code a model the fastest, that can do it. We're not that. But what we've learned to hone is those skills where we pay attention to those things, which is an art of doing the deal. 
the art of bringing things together because we're solving problems. In solving problems and in bringing solutions to the table, there will inevitably be curveballs. But it is learning to pay attention to those things. It is learning to have that 360 degree view um, to see when things are not aligned, to see, am I aligned with my client? Are we going in a different direction? Are there fears which are coming up, which are causing them to make decisions that are not rational? How do I help to talk them off of the ledge? In the same way, I have to talk myself off of the ledge when sometimes I get off the rails. And that's why I said I find that leadership is very much about self-mastery. Because if you learn to master yourself, your emotions, how you handle in stress, how you handle stress, how you function situations, um, that they're pressure, how you listen to people, how you translate that in solutions. If you can do that, you become better at helping people to bring that to the table. Because believe me, some of the most brilliant solutions don't necessarily come from me. It comes from creating the space for my team to speak up. Because sometimes they said, you don't share I was looking at a deal that they did in Brazil and you know they did and I was just like, wait, brilliant idea. Okay, how can we think about it's an idea? How does that distill down? That is the joy of the problem solving and realizing that the solutions come from everywhere. These are some of the best tools that I have because it's going to come from people who are on the same level, people that work in different regions, people that work above me, people that work below me. Sometimes I think I have a solution, my government throws something out to me and it's just like, I like that, that makes sense. They will challenge me to do something and I say, okay, how could I think about it differently? And it's all a matter of, can I take that information, assimilate that information, dissect that information and come out with a better, a stronger solution? If you get wedded to solutions, very often you miss the best answers. So is it about being open, feeding your curiosity, listening like you said uh, which help you through to elevate and I really like what you said around as a leader it's around self mastery and I guess when I think about you and your journey one of the I guess, hardest things you had to face was when you were dealing with cancer and there was a lot of lessons you have actually described it as a gift like because one of the few people I've ever had described cancer as the gift of lessons from that from going through that experience and like wanting to lean into that, like how was that for you first finding out and then going through that experience? And so again, you know, I'll break it down and dissect it into very human terms. I, I had that, exp I mean, I had the full gamut of emotions. Like when they told me, when, when they told me, first thing I was just like, okay, wait, it was like surreal, like, okay, no, these people cannot be talking about me. Like what? And then they started to use big words like, you're going to have to have chemotherapy. I was like, what? Like, it was like, it, my life for me did not make sense for a while. And it was that moment that brought me to my knees that said, while we have this illusion of control in our lives, there is not actually full control. There is power, however, in accepting that and learning to surrender. And as a recovering control freak, I put my hand up because I used to love to control the narrative on everything. Because if you're a perfectionist, you like things to function. And if you do it yourself, you know how it goes. And da -da 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 it's exhausting. What that journey taught me is really dropping into myself and saying, what is it that fundamentally I know in my heart of hearts? What is it that fundamentally I believe in every being every, every molecule of my being. And I believe, I tell people, I'm a banker who's a fairy child. I believe, I still believe in miracles. Because the way that I found that lump was miraculous. Um, a lump which was missed by a mammogram and discovered because I found it myself and picked up on an ultrasound. And I remembered my first meeting with my oncologist saying, let me just let me, let, let, let me just be clear and just let you know how things are going to go. Still a little element of the control freak. And I said to him, I just want you to know that this is a year of magic and miracles. I said, that's what we're here to manifest. I said, I'm getting early signals already, just in terms of how I found it. This is miraculous. So this is how it's going to play out. So I'm just putting you on early notice so that when you start seeing the signals manifesting of what I already know, you're not surprised. And I looked at him and he said to me, 
says Miss Otty, I like the way you think. Because it's the people who have that mindset that are very often the very people who will manifest exactly the miracle that they believe in their heart or hearts. And that's how I approach that journey. And I said, listen, when you have to stare on your own mortality in the face, and when there are things that you don't control and you have to put your life in somebody's hand, there comes a point of surrender. And I had to surrender that and say, I leave this to a higher power. My responsibility, again, back to self-mastery. How I keep myself in a positive frame of mind through this. How I prepare myself for this journey. I did not discuss that journey with many of my clients. I worked right throughout. Because I, yes, because I was just like, no, but we're working on this deep. No, I can't, no, because this next time it's going to happen, but excitement, I don't, and the excitement of my deals. And so I had an agreement with my boss that, Okay, I'm gonna do treatment, and I did treatment um, every other Tuesday for four for four months. And I said, listen, I'm gonna need, you know, the day off that I do treatment, and for two days after, I'd be tired. Again, you have sometimes you have to also learn to shut out the noise because very early people would have a view. Oh, Michelle, I had a friend who went through it. This is not as difficult. It's not as easy. Things it's gonna be difficult, or you're gonna be sick, or you're gonna be this. My mother, she's like me, very positive. She says, oh, we're going to go and see a nutritionist. We're going to figure out how to eat for this thing. I did. I had an aggressive form. I did dose-dense chemotherapy. And um, I didn't get sick one day. I'm a girl that loves food, by the way. I did not get sick one day. I did have tiredness, incredible tiredness, two days after. And I would have a treatment that would help to um, rebuild my blood cells, which were damaging chemotherapy. And I'd be exhausted that day. Then after that, I'd be like, energy, okay, back. Beautiful thing, doing that through COVID, because why? Everybody was virtual. So it was like, okay, I'm going to come back at work. Okay, what's happening? What's excitement? What did I miss? Excitement. <laughs> Michelle, what do you think about this? We talk about this. And I'd be like, okay, listen, three o'clock, I'm exhausted. My day's done. I need to have a nap. I'd go down. But I found that it also helped me to take my mind off of the immediate challenge. Because it was, I'm waking up with purpose. I'm waking up to do something that I love. The other thing that COVID gifted me was time to, uh, to, es to essentially explore another aspect of myself. I had started writing during COVID because I did not consider myself to be a writer. Um, I used to journal. Um, and writing became, in COVID, when everything stopped, the noise of the world the things that we distract ourselves with, and I was left in my apartment, I started the grief that came up from losing my dad, who had lost three years earlier, came up. And I started to write about it. It started to be a journal, but the journal became a book. And it's now been, let's see, I started writing two years ago. It's now 10 chapters, 50,000 words. That has been my self-expression. But it was my self-expression as well through cancer because it was just like, there are lessons in the challenges. Because think about it. When life is going well and everything is fine, how much do you learn? You just enjoy the ride. You're like, oh, life is good. Yes. It is those moments sometimes that bring us to our knees that is that, that point of reflection that you stop and say, okay, what, what is happening? And I did not understand what was happening at the time. And I had a tight circle where I would discuss this with what was happening, what I was feeling on a given day. But as well, gift as well, double-edged double sword. Um, I had an allergic reaction to one of the drugs. They had to put me on steroids. And it would steroids would wake me up at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock in the morning, I'd be on my computer. I would wake up awash with ideas, and I would write, and I would write, and I would write. And so I had all of these ideas that I was writing. And that's how I came to know Jessica, Jessica Huey. Because Jessica wrote, Jessica's book Purpose is just phenomenal. And she chronicles her journey, um, especially caring through her dad with cancer. And then I was just like, here it was, I am dealing with the grief of losing my dad, which I saw in her book. But here it was immediately, I'm thinking, and now I'm dealing with a cancer journey. And she wrote this brilliant book. And Jessica and I connected and started talking. And she said, Michelle, just send me your transcript. And she said to me, Michelle, this is raw, this is powerful, and this is unscripted. And I said to her, yeah, but I'm not a writer, I'm not an author. She said, stop putting yourself in a box, you absolutely are. Just do what you're doing without thinking about an agenda. 
And so I have become, I've started to embrace multiple facets of who I am. I could do work. I could be somebody on a healing journey from cancer. I could be somebody who is, and I would say to people, there is being cured from cancer physically and there is healing from it. The experience and the healing experience is a holistic experience, mind, body, spirit healing. And when I got, when I was going through that journey, there was that inflection point that I knew that I needed something different. Again, the whisperings that come to us. Because I had been at that time living out of Jamaica, which is my home country, um, for almost 13 years. And during that period, I had a lot of support. My mom, my sister were there in Washington with me um, through that journey for an extended period. And I remember getting to the end of all of the surgeries, getting to the end of getting the end of chemotherapy. There was nothing else. And my mom said, okay, all right, sweetheart, I love you, I'm gone. And I like, like it hit me. Oh, she doesn't have a return ticket back? Wait, I'm on my own? And I'm just like, I want to go home. I wanted to go home. But what happens again? Human response. The fear kicked up and I was just like, no, I taught me. No, but I, my job is in Washington. I can't do it. I just, so, no, but I have a straight apartment that I love. No, I can't do it for these reasons. And the overthinking started. And when that start, stat started, it was, I had to just stop myself. And I had to stop myself with support of a life coach that helped to walk me through the cell. And we walked through that process. And it took me a while. It took me from September back to January when I made a decision. But from September, I'd set an intention and it didn't come true right away when the opportunity presented itself. And I thought to myself, my God, isn't this life amazing? When the time is right and when you're aligned, things just line up like this. You set the intention though. The intention was there. That's the key. Yes. The intention was there because you, that means your eyes were open for you to, to receive when everything else did line up, which was, which was important. And the intention is huge. But one of the things, again, I had to, I have, and it's an ongoing, life is an ongoing learning for me because you have to know yourself and your personality. I know that I am a con recovery control freak. I know I like to control the narrative. I know I'd like to figure everything out because it's like I'm there and I like to figure out, okay, I want to move. How is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? Should I do this? Should I do this? Once I start hearing my mind, it's like, stop. Stop. Rabbit hole. Rabbit hole moment. And when the rabbit hole moment comes, you know you need to let go of the how. The intention is, what do I want to achieve? The how, you have to surrender that. And in surrender, the opportunity opened itself because we started a transaction and we're doing, you know, we're January of 2023. We're kicking off our program of three roads that we're working on with the government of Jamaica. We're sitting with the Minister of Finance and he says to us, yeah, we have a big infrastructure program that we need to develop and we'd like to have somebody senior here or placed in Jamaica. And I was just like, wait, what could it be? Could <laughs> And I just said, oh, Minister, i happy to do that. I looked at my boss. My boss looked at me because I'd been talking with him about my desire to spend some time back home and to have support. And it was that moment of synchronicity that I was just like, this was my signal. And this signal was twinned with another signal. I had been obsessing about moving back to Jamaica. And, oh, but I love my place in D.C. Oh, but I love the city. Oh, but where am I going to be in Jamaica? And a bit over. In fact, I went home for Christmas um, in December of 2022. I came back home on the 4th of January. Flights delayed. I'm tired. I get to bed at midnight. Half an hour late. I'm in a deep sleep. Half an hour late. I wake up both upright. And literally an address comes to me. And so, you know, it's one of those moments where you think like, am I crazy? So much so that the next morning I call my sister and I said, I don't know if I'm crazy, but I'm just telling you this. So that just in case I am, you know, somebody else can tell me that. And she's just like, she says, no, that's your moments of inspiration. And she said, you're going to have to learn to listen to the advice that you give other people. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, do you remember when I was looking to buy a new house? And I found this place that it looked like it wasn't going to happen. And you said to me, just believe it. Even though it seems crazy, just keep affirming it and just let it go. It will happen the way it's supposed to happen. And I always used to say to her, affirm that or better. Because that's something that my coach always used to say. 
leave room for the universe to delight you because sometimes it can deliver more than you dreamed possible. I could not dream how I could have a job in Washington and be sitting in Jamaica, but I did. I had certain things that I wanted to do in terms of where I wanted to live in Jamaica. I wanted to also have a different relationship. My relationship evolved with my mom through chemotherapy, through surgery, through that whole, my whole cancer journey. And we spent five years together. She spent five years living with me in D.C. And I said, you know, I also wanted to think, you know, her transition in terms of spending more time with her, her transition, because I lost my dad. Um, this year was five years on since I lost him. And it's looking at what's the next level for her. And I enjoy spending time with her. So I wanted space that I could welcome her into my space. But what are the things that are important to her? She's not like me, that she grows up and she doesn't want a swanky condo in the middle of the city. She wants somewhere that she can step out and have grass. She wants somewhere that she can grow plants. That's how she creates differently. And I wanted an environment that was supportive to us both. Well, would you know that that address that popped into my mind when the Minister of Finance made that statement, I had, while on that trip, I had set up with a real estate agent to see that property. I saw that property for others. And by the end of that day, I knew that was where I want to live. That's where I'm living now. And my mom and I are delighted. She comes and stays with me three to four days a week. And the rest of the time, she's at her home. So her transition is happening. And she says to me, I feel like I have the best of both worlds. I was just like, well, we'd win. So do I. I said, I live in Jamaica and I still have my job in Washington. I'm still connected to my network. And I'm going, but I'm functioning in a different way. I'm reconnecting to my Caribbean roots. I'm inspired. I'm writing. I'm doing all kinds of things. So... What it's taught me is, what that cancer journey taught me is the beauty of surrender. Sometimes it is realizing that you let go of the control of your life and allow your life to serve you a bigger dream than you could dream for yourself. It's allowing me to be a part of a bigger transformation. And yes, the infrastructure nerd with me swelled with pride when the Minister of Finance in an op-ed said, he intends to call in 1.5 billion US dollars in private finance to drive infrastructure and to transform the economy. And I said to my team, we, we are helping to do that. And when I'm working in another country and they have targets for to move an entire island to be renewables generation, and we are working on projects there, I'm like, we are helping to do that. So now I realize that the game, it's no longer about me. It's no longer about targets that I'm going to smash. It's about what impact do I want to make. The other gift of cancer is it made me think about legacy. What's the legacy that I want to leave? What do, if, what, if, if tomorrow I'm not here or the day after that, and my legacy is twofold, for the countries that I work in, I want to make a difference in people's lives and I want to help transform economies. The other legacy that I want to leave is the people that I work with. Because I see the young, bright minds coming up. The next young whippersnapper who, like me, thought, yeah, I'm it. I didn't realize at the time what was ahead <laughs> and how much shifts I'd have to make and how much twists and turns. But I see that. And what I love most of all is attitude. Because I said, a lot of people have a great attitude for learning. Attitude is that thing. It's in the mind. And you can see those who have that attitude that want to be normal. And the next legacy I want is to help go the next generation of leaders. I do it through my mentoring. I do it through things like I said to my boss, I'd like to do leadership coaching because coaching is available to someone at my level. But the next level coming up, they don't have access to coaching now. How do I help to, how do I help to go them? And, you know, I was doing a performance evaluation. And I said to one of my staff, I remember, I said to her, it was like, I said, I'd done um, the Global Business Leadership Program and I had evaluations that were 360 and my staff said, I got the feedback and she was amazing at what she does. She just needs to give people room. And that was a moment that made me realize that in, in being so busy trying to prove myself, I was crowding what the very people I was trying to motivate and develop. And it was one of those step back moments for me, that moment that made me pause. And I look at her now and she's where I was nine years ago. And I said to her, by the way, I said, you're like me, you're a perfectionist. You like to get things done. You like to do everything yourself. I said, what got you here is not going to get you there. You're going to need that mindset shift. So we're now going to start talking about your career, not in terms of what you do, 
but how you are, how you be, how you exist in this world, how you bring others along with you, how you delegate, because you'll meet what you can do on your own is a fraction of what you can do when you do it together with people. And so the mindset shift becomes, how do I unlock that in other people? How do I get them on board with the vision that I have? Because people will always trust the leader before they trust the vision. So I have to build trust. I have to build trust with my clients. I have to build trust with my staff. I have to build trust with people that I interact with to get things done. I have to build trust with the investors. I have to build trust with lenders. But you can't build trust if you're talking all the time. You have to listen to people. You have to hear their concerns. You have to respond to them. And you have to have the maturity to realize you don't have all the solutions, but you can be the conduit through which brilliant things happen if you step back and let ideas in. And so I look at myself as a conduit, but a conduit that's having a lot of fun and doing amazing infrastructure and doing fun things. And so if I look at my cancer journey, it was that gift that broke down in my mind that illusion of control. It's that gift that allowed me to surrender. It's that gift that has changed my leadership where I am much more compassionate, where I am willing to do bigger asks, to do better thing, bigger things. It is that part of my journey that led me from where I was back home. And I think of that home as being home physically, but also home to myself. It is that journey that has brought me to a new level of depth that I can hold space for deeper conversations with people. And so ultimately, was it difficult? Yes. But was it worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Last year, I set an intention for a year of magic and miracles. And this year, I had a massive girls retreat and a massive party, I said. This was what we asked for, and this is what we got. Set intentions, go after it, and then celebrate the hell out of each and every victory. Come on. <laughs> Absolutely love that. And in fact, brother asked that question, when is the book coming out then? I don't know when the book is coming out. Um, I've just started. I write sort of short pieces, you know, sometimes, like you asked me the question, you know, like, I want to know a little bit about you, and it comes out as, a piece that I write that's about my leadership journey. So I'm allowing myself to lean into different spaces. I think the book is coming out shortly. And you know why? Because I feel like I'm completing one cycle of my life and stepping into another cycle. And it feels to me as if the book has served its purpose for that cycle of transformation of my life. I feel like I've had some powerful lessons out of that transformation that other people can learn from. But I'm stepping into a place of inspiration that is just like, I mean, I, I'm sorry, sorry, like a giddy child, but you know, like sometimes I say to my mom and my sister, oh my God, I just love my life. I just love my life. And my mom and my sister always say to me, yes. And I remember a year ago when you were struggling, there were days, some days that I would struggle to get up because I'm like, it was really hard. I had had a double mastectomy. I could not lift a hand sometime to open a cupboard. I had to have help to get dressed. And look at me now. And I always say to people, what it has taught me is impermanence of life. And it's a beautiful thing because when it's good, enjoy it for what it is. And when it is bad, remember that it will not last. I am a testament to the fact that, my God, what was a cancer journey last year has put me into a beautiful space this year. And what was me living in D.C. questioning my life and why it makes sense has brought me into Jamaica with all kinds of answers. The transformation cycle is complete, and so I feel that the book is going to naturally complete itself. But I always leave room for more, and I say, you know what? I think it's time. But if there's more in store and there's better in store and there's more that has to go into the book, it will adjust itself. I don't worry about the how now. I set the intentions. And if I'm aligned, the universe will do the rest. And I say, this has been such a, I said it right at the start, we never knew where we were going to go with this. This is going to be a powerful conversation. And listening to you capture elements of your, 
your journey, both in a professional setting, but your personal journey and what you've learned from like battling, overcoming cancer, but listening to the joy, the overall joy coming out from you. For me, it feels like that place of knowing you operate from abundance and overflow. That's the space that you are, you're operating from. Like you said, like it's been a journey. It's not been easy to get to where you've got to, but the fact that you had that intention, you had that mindset, you had that mentality and you moved towards it to do your bit and you let God do his bit and everything else is kind of working out for you and you're living proof that that's what happens when you move in a particular way. It's amazing because there's something that you said earlier on around trust. You talked about you need to trust your team, trust your leadership, trust the different elements. But the one thing that you didn't mention, which I believe personally, is you also need to learn to trust yourself because there are times that things that happen to us that we can go back to like, you know what? I said I was going to do X and I've done X. And we have that validation to ourselves like, you know what? We can trust ourselves and trust our journey to know that we are setting the intention and we're going to walk towards it. And that is key because that's the thing that drives us the most to move us forward, to be able to do every single thing else that we talked about. Absolutely. And, you know, it's trusting the journey. That's how we got connected. I was in London and I ended up having a two-hour tea with Jessica that led to a discussion on ideas. She said, I want to connect you with somebody that we started having a dialogue. And so as well, I find when you're in that space of trust and in a space of alignment, literally the people that are meant to be there, the people that bring inspiration, the conversations that inspire, that make you think differently, think better, they come into your life effortlessly. That's how I know I'm in alignment because there is a feeling of synchronicity and ease in my life. But I don't ever forget the journey and where I came from because a year ago I was a very different person and I was in a very different space. So people may look at me and say, yeah, well, it's easy for you. No, it wasn't. And I never forget that. And so it was, is, it is for me with the deepest gratitude as I move forward with my life, as I move forward with inspired spaces, professionally, personally, in different aspects of my life, in being in my home country, that I just, there's gratitude. There's gratitude in that. I guess the best way for me to finish off is asking you, how do you define leadership? If I define leadership, leadership for me is really about my ability to inspire others. It's not about my, there's a difference between management and leadership. I don't need to be that person that tells you, you need to do this, you need, that's management. Leadership is by the way I live my life, by the actions that I take, by the way that I carry myself, that I can inspire others to be along the journey with me because I'm stronger as a team. I have an amazing team that I work with, but again, I want for them to trust me. I want for them to trust the vision that I have. And if I can articulate that vision in a way that they can get on board and they can follow that journey and they can bring themselves to that, those conversations, into those places, into those spaces, that's when we're powerful as a team. And that for me is leadership. The game is not, the game starts with me because I have to master everything for myself to be able to bring people along. But ultimately that is just the portal to the bigger picture, which is inspiring others to help us to do transformative things, to have impact and cliche as it sounds, to change the world. It's not cliche. The intention is there, and if, as evidence is shown, once the intention is there, the actions are going to follow suit, and that's what you need, because if you want someone who's going to, like I said, transform economies and infrastructures and make changes into spaces like that, you need someone who's going to have that vision and that approach. So for me, it's such an amazing speaking to you, listening to you and your journey, and then thinking about the position that you operate in and knowing that actually this is someone who is behind the scenes pulling things together to improve the, the Caribbean, to improve places like Jamaican, my wife's Jamaican and I've been there a number of times. So there's a, there's a love and affinity there for me naturally speaking anyway. But, <laughs> but we have a lot of conversations around what's going on in the, in the Caribbean and other countries like that who's making those changes. I'm like, whoa, there are people behind the scenes who actually generally 
here and they're pulling the strings in a sense to try and listen and create the right environments for people and transform the environments they're operating in. And for me, it's, it's great to hear, great to get to know you, great to listen to your journey. I'm definitely inspired. I am definitely looking out for that book when it lands because I'm going to buy it, promote it, talk about it. So people can definitely tap into that wealth of wisdom that you have. But more importantly, you were just, I guess, given a master, a masterclass in what it looks like when you have the right mentality, the right mindset, the right intention, and you got off and you got off to live in a very fulfilled life rather than just existing. And that's kind of what I've, I've learned from this. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. This has, this has really been wonderful. And um, yep. Look for that book. It's coming one of these days. Whenever it's time, it will it will make its way into the world. <laughs> <laughs> this is Erida Leadership. We'll see you next time. <laughs>